Welcome to a Nitpicky Nerd Countdown Baby. It's the top 15 cards from Crimson Vow. I'm your host, Joe Cherries. I'm your host, BZ, and that makes us the Nitpicking Nerds. We're bringing you daily content. Happy birthday to whoever's birthday we're making this on. And guess what? Tomorrow, same deal. There's going to be another Commander video because we do them all the time. If you want to support us in our awesome endeavors, Patreon.com is the link for you. It's in the description along with several other links. You can support the channel. It's the best way to do that. Another way to support us is to click on the affiliate link for TCG Player and buy any amount of cards you want. You go through that link, and as long as you click the link, wow, holy crap, you're supporting us and buying cards that you wanted anyway? And if you want to buy sleeves, the best sleeves that exist ever, period, full stop, Dragon Shield also have affiliates for the U.S. and the EU people. Find your link, click, buy the sleeves, boom, money in the Nipiki Nerds pockets for free. You didn't spend any extra. Easy peasy, lemon squeezies. Let's get into this video. This is the our favorite, the best, the most powerful cards from Crimson Vow. There's 15 here, but we're going to start with an honorable mention before we hop in. That's the enemy slow lands. These are probably the best cards in the set, actually. Up there. They're definitely up there. They're like top five, but we already did it last time. We ranked them highly, and this is just the other half of the cycle. These are some of the best duels ever. It's just good to get it out there if you didn't already know. Yeah, these are great, great cards for Commander, um, but we don't want to put them on this list because that's a boring spot. So let's start with number 15. It is Lantern of the Lost. So one mana artifact, one lantern of the lost enters the battlefield. Exile target card from a graveyard. Pay one, tap, exile lantern of the lost. Exile all cards from all graveyards, then draw a card. This card is interesting and could potentially be higher in the list if not for the fact that Relic of Progenitus exists and, uh, what's the other one? Lantern, Soul Guide Lantern. Soul Guide Lantern both exist. Both those cards are better than this. So this is your third option. But it's almost on, it's pretty much like identical, other than Soul Guide Lantern, if you want to hate out just other graveyards. See, I don't know about that. I think Soul Guide Lantern is the best one, but this might be better than Relic of Progenitus. Okay. Relic of Progenitus has, similar to this, they both can tag cards before they do their big thing. Except Relic, you don't get to choose. This is like, here's the best thing from a graveyard is gone. I can keep this on board now, wait until somebody tries anything else, and then just boom, crack it. But with Relic, there's no way you're going to ever take their best thing. Okay, so maybe if you don't care about your own graveyard, this is obviously better than Soul Guide Lantern, making it the best choice if you just want to hand yeah. out graveyards colorlessly, meaning you can do this in any, literally any color. You can do it in green, you can do it in red, you can do it in black, you can do it in white, and you can do it in the fourth color I forgot. Is colorlessly like a new adverb? Colorlessly, yes. Perfect. Do it without using any colors. Yes. All right, number 14. Now, I think we, we sold this one a little short in the set review, so we're going to clear that up right now. It's Hallbreaker Horror. Five blue blue for a 7-8 Kraken Horror with Flash. It can't be countered, and whenever you cast a spell, you either return target spell you don't control to its owner's hand, or return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. Now, we gave, I think, we gave this like a D something in the set mm -hmm. review, but we're, I think that was the wrong grade, but we still kind of feel the same way about it. I think it's more like a B, where... When you build around it and you're like this counterspell heavy or flash heavy, like a Nimrus deck or something, where you're slinging a million spells and you got cantrips, then this is like a really good finisher. It's one of the better cards in your deck. It's your top end go to choice card. But outside of that, it's like terrible. It doesn't. It just doesn't do enough. Yeah, I think it's super important. Yeah, build around is the key to this card. This doesn't go in many decks. There aren't a ton of decks that exist right now that do want this card. But the decks that do want it, it's it's insane. It's perfect. And it's going to close out the game. The fact that this has flash adds to the fact that if most of your spells are at instant speed, well, so is this one. You get it in, and all you have to do is get past one end step before you untap with your whole like lot of mana. Then you can just counter anything, like bounce all the spells back to their hand. They better have a really, really cheap, like efficient swords to plowshares, and yeah. they're not answering this. Because even if they pull a fast one. You can always, like, let's say they do have a Swords to Plowshares, and bouncing it's not going to do anything. You can just bounce the Kraken yep. in response, and now they can't do it. They, their Swords just fizzles, and you can deploy it now without a Swords in someone's hand. Yeah. Well, Whole Break of Horror, it doesn't belong in a lot of decks, and that's why we were so low on it. Yeah. But it, there's like there's probably like 1%, 0.5% of decks out there that want this. And those decks are going to get a huge buff from this card. Yeah, it's like a D overall, but we should have given it a B, because in certain decks, it's like one of your best cards. So it is solid for like the control, dirtily, draw-go decks. Yes, absolutely. Next is Breath Kiefer Seraph. 
This one comes from the Crimson Vow Commander cards for white, white, creature, angel, 4-4, four, four, flying, and soul bond. Soul bond is you may pair this creature with another unpaired creature when it enters the battlefield. They remain paired for as long as you control both of them. As long as Breathkeeper Seraph is paired with another creature, each of those creatures has. When this creature dies, you may return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of your next end step. So the ceiling on this card is much lower than like whole Breacher Horror, but it fits in a lot more decks. If you're playing a decent chunk of creatures, you can throw this in as your top end and it's going to perform well. It's annoying to answer at minimum. With a sack outlet, it lets you play Breathkeeper Seraph sack whatever creature you soul bonded with and at the end step it comes back you get the etbs the dice triggers then they repair and then you're insulated from board wipes that destroy for the whole turn because they both die then they'll both come back at your next end step and repair for the same shenanigans and you just the only thing you can't do that i think maybe it's not super obvious is like you can't sack both of them for like value uh you can sack the seraph to repair it and you can sack the creature to get the etbs and dies triggers but it's going to be a Carnival of value. Yeah, uh, actually, the, it's funny. You can't you can't sack both of them unless if it's paired with a creature that dies into another creature. You can yeah you can sack the creature that goes to your graveyard. Then the new creature comes in and the seraph can pair with it, and then you can take the seraph. Or you can use like specifically a card like uh, priest. What is there's a card of fell rights where you sacrifice two. Where you sacrifice two creatures. It's like so you can do that. And because that exists, is it Priest of Fellwrights? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, that's the reanimator. It's Priest of the Ancient God. It's on the it's on the screen. Don't worry about it. There is definitely a card that lets you sacrifice two creatures, and that card specifically will let you sacrifice both and get both triggers. Ancient <laughs> Priest of Forgotten Gods. Ro priest of the Forgotten Gods. Well, we got there. We first fi try. Finally figured it out. We're experts at this. We. It's almost like this is our profession. We're so good. So good. Uh, number twelve here. We're climbing up the ranks. Headless Rider, two and a black for a three one zombie. Whenever it or another zombie that's non token dies under your control, you just get a two two zombie. Your dom your zombies die into zombies. You pair this with like Wilhelt, your zombies die into zombies that die into zombies. Just nuts. It's super interesting because this card existed in the form of Xanthrid Necromancer for humans. The exact same card. Yeah. But it was for humans. Uh, that di dying into zombies from humans is bad because it doesn't help our like tribals and zombies want to die way more than humans. True. This card, if again, it, if it's any other type, it's just okay. It literally doesn't matter what other type it is. It's just okay. Zombie dying into zombie that makes it really good. They even gave us an extra power, which is is not the focal point of the card, but it's mm -hmm. so much better than if it was a two two or a one three. Like I just do not care about what the toughness of my utility creature is. So what I want is high power and low toughness so I can skull clamp it or disciple bolas it to draw three cards instead of like two. Just random little upsides like that I, I also like over a 2-2. Two -two. And this is like the one of the best zombie tribal payoffs that isn't draw a card. Yeah, it's an absolutely great payoff. And it just makes more zombies. Zombies making zombies. Come on, it's so good. Also, um... There's definitely, this opens up some extra loops with like Phyrexian Altar, I'm sure. Uh, it'll help trigger your uh, your nether traders twice as many times and make sure grave crawlers still going ham. Uh, this just is very specific. You got to be literally zombies. You have to have 35 zombies in your deck before you want Headless Rider. Yes. Uh, next is Overcharged Amalgam. Two blue blue creature, zombie horror, flash, 3-3, three, three. flying, and exploit. Exploit is when this creature enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice a creature. When overcharged my one exploits a creature, counter target spell, activated ability, or triggered ability. So in the decks you're going to be playing this in, this is just going to be Mystic Snake because you're not going to care. You're going to have tons of fodder to be sacrificing. The fact that this also hits those uh, triggered and activated abilities, just extra gravy on top. You're mostly going to counter spells, but sometimes it's like a Planeswalker ultimate will feel great. I think I like this card a lot it's really cool it looks like so on rails but it's like the only playable blue creature only like mono blue creature that enters and counters a spell you gotta pay a creature but there's plenty of blink decks and zombie decks and whatever token decks that can satisfy that condition but other than this if you want to counter a spell you have like draining welk and that card stinks so rooster you're just it to four mana even giving it flying this is a sweet upgrade I think a lot of decks are going to like this, even though it looks like a standard card. Yeah, just make sure you have. A, just make sure that your deck has disposable creatures, and this card will perform very well. Yeah, feel free to flicker it. Number 10. Number 10. 
is Thundering Mightmare. Four and a green for a 3-3 Horse Spirit with Soul Bond. As long as it's paired with another creature, each of those creatures has... Whenever an opponent casts a spell, put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature. So not only will Thundering Mightmare be growing whenever an opponent casts a spell, the creature you pair it with will also be growing. This is so much different from Forgotten Ancient and Mana Gorger Hydra and Torian Mauler. Forgotten Ancient is actually good, but the other two I think are not very good. They're just stats. They're just vanilla. And despite having Trample or being a Changeling, I just don't think they do enough. But because this puts counters on itself, and another creature will make sure that creature uses counters like Crystalline Crawler, Skullbriar, Gyre Sage, and Marwin the Nurturer, Selvala, something. We're going to have tons of synergy, and it's going to actually make it worth it. Yeah, uh, this card is going to grow to be a threat itself, which, you know, that's that's good. We're not going to, we're not too, I mean, it's going to get chump blocked all day, every day. It'll be like a 9, 9, a 10, 10, but the other thing is key. What are you putting it on? Are you, is it a walking blister? Are you pinging things off, making a ton of mana that's, all about making sure the other creature can use those pow uh, counters. Even if your commander is some trampoly boy, that's almost a good enough reason in itself to maybe play this card. Because if you have like a 7-7 seven, seven trample commander, all of a sudden you play this, guess what? If they don't kill this, the board goes around once, it's going to have like five extra counters. That's like a two shot. Commander damage becomes real, real threat in those situations. And the thing I like about this card is that it builds a threat. They get bigger at the same time. Now, we can't talk about board wipes because everything dies to a board wipe. But we have a spot removal situation. You have a 12-12 like Crystalline Crawler and then like a 15-15 Thundering Mightmare. Which one is your opponent going to kill? You have to kill the Crystalline Crawler and then, oh, we're just going to solve on something else next turn and start over. Yeah, exactly. And if even if you kill the... And if you choose to kill a Thundering Mightmare because you want to stop the counter train, well, guess what? Then they're left with whatever other big threat. Either it's like a lose lose situation. It's either answer both or uh, cry. It's pretty sweet. I like it's like a sweet spot at five mana. It doesn't feel crazy overcosted. It's like right in the sweet spot. Yes. Next we have Torin's Fist of the Angels at number nine. One green white legendary creature, human cleric. Two two training. Training is whenever this creature attacks with another creature with greater power, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. Whenever you cast a creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one green human soldier creature token with training. It has like seven caveats on what it is. The reason this card stays a little low on the list is it's two colors, so it doesn't really go in as many decks. But when you find the homes for it, the decks that he's going to shine in, these are going to be 30, 40 creature decks. And every single one of your spells is going to come with an extra 1-1 one, one, that'll buff up to a 2-2 two, two when it attacks, and any of them that don't die in combat will be 3-3's three, next combat. I just think that this this is an army in a can, um, even especially because if you have him as your commander, let's just say, is it, this isn't about his commander, it's in the 99, but if you have him as your commander or something, think of a white main lion. Well, you can just keep making these 2-2's two, two, every single 2 mana you have. Oh, he's great. Torrance has a ton of synergy, and 2-color legends like never make it on our top cards of the set list because they're just so specific and usually they're all, they're their own thing but this is just monastery mentor for creatures which is better for like half of the decks that care about tokens there's some decks that have monastery mentor because it's a nice token maker there's not a ton that make him reliably like that maybe just switch them out for torrents it goes in token decks it goes in counters decks it goes in just anything with a bunch of creatures in it it's so sweet the tokens are deceptive they are actually two twos at least who knows what other synergies you have, but Torrens is sweet. I mean, if you have synergies, like you said, this goes in counters. Like, if you have synergies with counters, like when a counter is put on a creature, do something. Oh, this can. If you have the double counters, they attack with training, and now all of a sudden they're three threes because of like a hardened scales. That's that's crazy considering how easy these tokens are to make. They're free to make. They're they're trivial. And he's only three mana. This card is three mana. The card that like I what well, that makes me think like that is similar to this is like God Eternal Catcher. That's a five mana card. That's a lot more hefty. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's get to number eight, which is a, the like the only other relevant card with training that exists. Savior of Allenbach. One white white for a one two human soldier with training. Whenever it trains, exile up to one other target creature from the battlefield or creature card from a graveyard. When it leaves the battlefield, put the exiled cards onto the battlefield under their owner's control. So what you're going to do is you're going to slam it turn three or whenever you can play it soonest. You have to wait a whole turn, but then once you do, you're in gravy town because you attack, it trains, you're going to have something else sw uh, swing in the red zone too. It trains, and then you're already going to say, all right, if you have the best creature or you have a commander, I'm going to take it out. Or if I have a creature I really want back, I want this Sun Titan. I want this Seven Drive. I want this Elishnorn. Boom. Put it under here, and now what are they supposed to do? 
they could trade or block and kill it, and then you just get your best creature back for three mana. Or they could take it, but then next turn, the train just builds and builds and builds, and there's more things under it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the thing is this. You build inevitability where you put – once you put one of your creatures under it, they're stuck in a situation where it's like, sure, I can block it now, but the thing underneath it is much more scary. That Alice Jones is going to wipe my board. I can't afford to kill it, so they let it hit them. But it's like next turn, you do it again. You put another creature from your graveyard under it. Now it's just building up. And if you have a sack outlet, you get to choose when you get them. The key here is to make sure you – uh, can try and get him through. His his weakness is he does have to attack, and you do have to attack with a second creature with a higher power than him for him to trigger. Now, that isn't the easiest thing in the world to do, but once you do it, it just it makes it so, so hard to beat after that. Well, sending in a 2-2 is pretty trivial. I, I'll be able to train this the first time. Maybe the next time you got to find something to do, but one, one is the sweet spot. Yeah, you get in the spot that turns this into like a mini Angel of Serenity, or the, the ceiling could be higher, but we're going to at least get one, and it's so much cheaper. Yeah, Angel of Serenity puts stuff back to hand. This one puts it back to the battlefield. So this card just has a high ceiling of the possibilities for things to do. Removal, or it can be reanimation. That's kind of a weird versus It's a weird versatility thing. I've never really seen a card be reanimation or removal. Yeah, I like this little guy. All right, who's number seven? Uh, number seven is Mirage Phalanx. Four red red for a creature, human soldier, four four. It has soul bond. As long as Mirage Phalanx is paired with another creature each of those creatures has at the beginning of the next combat on your turn, create a token that's a copy of this creature, except it has haste and loses soul bond. Exile it at the end of combat. So we've seen this effect before in many different forms and fashion. This one's on a creature, and usually these kind of effects are best in creature decks, meaning that you want a creature that does it, and on top of that, this ability has haste. As long as you already have a creature to pair with on the board, you spend the six mana, pair it, go to combat that very first turn, you get the new things and you get to attack with them that turn. Yeah, if opponents don't have removal, combat is about to get real nasty for them because you now have one, two, three extra creatures that are just not there that they weren't expecting and I want to make token copies of this so that I can get more token copies of it, not that can soul bond, and then they make ones that can't soul bond, and then you just get so many creatures that attack. I want to take extra combats. You can potentially go infinite with cards that say when they attack, you get an extra combat, like Combat Celebrant, where you're just making copies, they die, you're re-soul bonding, you're making more stuff. I like this card a lot. I think it's a really good curve topper. I think it's one of the better versions of the 75 effects like this that we have. Turns out Combat Celebrant goes infinite with like the hammiest of ham sandwiches. So As long as you can connect, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This card, uh, Phalanx being another one of them, and... Being a good card on top of going infinite, now that's that's where you want to be. You want a good card that just happens to have infinite combos. That's yes. that's a that's chef's kiss, as we say. Big fan of this one. How about number six? It's Necro Duality. Whenever a non-token zombie enters the battlefield under your control, you get a copy that's a token of it. That's pretty sick. Yeah, that's not how it's worded, but still fine because guess what? This card is awesome. I mean, it's super simple to see how good this card is. Uh, remove the word zombie. And imagine that's the card in any deck. That card's busted, right? Mm. It's completely and utterly insane. A, a four mana enchantment that copies all of your creatures? It's just okay. Volo. Uh, yeah, it's just, and you don't even have to jump through any hoops to get there. Well, now the only problem with this card and why it's number six here is because it's only zombie decks that can play it. But in zombie decks, it's exactly that card. Yeah. It is that card that I was mentioning where it just copies all your creatures. That is completely bonkers. because you only have to get one trigger off this and you feel like you've won the lottery. Just like with um, Rooftop Storm, this is going to actually probably be more good than it is fun. It's going to go infinite like really easily. If you have any creature that reanimates another creature when it enters, you already have infinite uh, deaths and ETBs with a sack outlet. You just need like, for example, uh, Rot Hulk. It just makes itself, but you respond to the trigger that makes a token, just put the original in your graveyard. Oops, now it comes back, and they go infinite over and over and over. All you gotta do is pay it off with, like, um, a Diagraph Captain, and or not Diagraph Captain, the zombie captain that makes them lose life, and you win. Well, zombies has the most insane payoffs. Oh like, my god. For being in zombies, like you said, Rooftop Storm and this. Those are two of the best single tribe payoffs. They might be the two single best single tribe payoffs we have just in ever. existence. Uh, the only one I can even think that compares is like Dragon Tempest. That's the closest thing <laughs> yeah. I can think of that compares to these two. T tell us below. Single tribe payoffs. What's what, the best? What are the best? Because I'm thinking Rooftop Storm, Necro Duality, and Dragon Tempest. 
And that's it. I can't think of another one that's even close to as good as these. I can't think of another one. That's that's completely crazy that the Zombies has two of the best. Yeah, the Necro Duality is going to be amazing if it's it's like a must kill. You have to kill it or you're probably just going to lose. Buried in I, value. Either buried in value or they're just going to kill you with or with a three card interaction. Yeah, exactly. You can either, like, it's same thing, like you said, Roof Dossum, you can go value route or you can go I absolutely, <laughs> or you can go I win. Both of them are completely possible with this card. Next we have number five is Scattered Thoughts. Three and a blue for an instant. Look at the top four cards of your library. Put two of them into your hand and the others into your graveyard. What rarity is this card? This is a common, in a common. This is a card that is only slightly worse than Factor Fiction. This card is just so good. You could just throw this in basically any blue deck, especially if you care about the graveyard in any way, and you're just going to be happy with it. This is a Great magic card for a common. It's a nice two for one. I think you kind of need the graveyard synergy so that it becomes draw three for, for mana because that's pretty that's pretty nice rate. You don't really get that on magic cards no, uh, nowadays. I think scattered dots is really good, especially considering it's a common. Like this effect is better than the first half of memory deluge, which is the main half ninety percent of the time on a rare. Really weird. Really yeah. weird that this card is a common. But it doesn't matter for us. We don't care what rarity it is. But if we ever talk about budget cards from now until the end of the universe, this is probably going to be mentioned. Yeah, this is a budget card, and even in the case, and I think this just goes in some non-budget decks. Yeah, for sure. Like you're, if you're, if you want a second copy of Factor Fiction, working with the graveyard, then this is it. This is the second copy of Factor Fiction. Yeah, I don't think there's much more to say. Just a really efficient draw spell. Get your hands on a few. Maybe pick up a few foils. You're, you're gonna, you're gonna need them eventually. All right, let's keep cracking on the top five here. This is number four. It's Storm of Souls. Four white, white for a sorcery. Return all creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. Each of them is a 1-1 one, one spirit with flying in addition to its other types. Exile, Storm of Souls. So they put Exile, Storm of Souls on it so you can't wombo combo and win. But guess what? We're still just going to do that anyway. We're going to loop our creatures by themselves. I don't care that they're 1-1s. One, they could have Defender. It just doesn't matter. Half of the time, this is... Bring all your things back, get a ton of ETB triggers, still get all your dice triggers, and the other half of the time is I'm just going to win because I got back Fiend Hunter and Sun Titan and I have a sack outlet, so like I'm just going to loop everything together and just dominate the game. Yeah, exactly. Your creatures, power, toughness don't matter. The downside is you're not going to attack for a win with these creatures. Yeah. Well, when you play this card, the decks that play it don't want to attack for wins anyway. They care about the answer to the battlefield. They care about infinite loops. They just, or they care about attacks, triggers, something along those lines. You're going to use these creatures in a more efficient way. Add in the fact that if you have a blink, you blink this and it comes back as not the spirit. If you ever need that, like in an Aminatu deck or, or a rune deck, those kind of decks, you bring back all your stuff, blink them. Now they are the regular power toughness on top of being of getting another ETB. And I can think of plenty of ETBs that totally invalidate the 1-1 one, one downside anyway. If I get back a Crater Hoof, guess what? It doesn't matter. I just need a Haste Enabler and I still win the game for 6 mana. All I have to do is be a graveyard-centric deck, filling things up, or just wait till the late game and my Blink Creatures died normally. I actually agree with Wizards for putting Exile itself on oh. this card. I'm not often in favor of that. Usually I'm like, oh, they're just being way too safe again. This one, no, it should be there. And I, honest, I honestly believe... They, 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 it belongs there. Yeah, because if, if I can go infinite with, like, Prurigan Drake or Eternal Witness for Exion Alter easily, like, this gets to be one of the premium combo things. But it's just really, really good. Sorry. Yes. Next, in number three, we're in the top three now. This is Undead Butler. One in the black for a creature zombie. When Undead Butler enters the battlefield, mill three cards. When Undead Butler dies, you may exile it. If you do, return target creature from your graveyard to your hand. All right, I've come around on this card since the set review. I was I was low on it to start. The fact is, this thing comes in, it mills three immediately. That's already great for this card to be doing. Then it dies, and it doesn't exile instead. No, no. So you any like. Uh, dies triggers like a Midnight Reaper or a Grim Horror Specs will still trigger. Then it goes to the graveyard and it's it's a May trigger. So you can choose to exile it and get a creature back or you can just leave it in your yard for your creature counts for things like Carador or whatever like that. This card is just like really, really good, especially for an uncommon. It's just, you can just throw it in basically any graveyard centric deck and be extremely happy with it. I don't think people expected our set review to have in the top five a common and an uncommon. Uh, this card has so many good numbers on it. It's not easy to find creatures that are serviceable and that mill you right away. I mean, 
we have like Citrus Supplier and Seder Wayfinder, like the two go-tos, but there's so many more that just like they mill three and that's kind of it. But this one, you mill three and then it's going to be around there later to just rebuy your best thing basically on demand because you're a graveyard deck with sack outlets. Like you said, on demand. It's just, it's an easy button. If you're if you're playing that graveyard deck, you know that there's a sack outlet sitting on the battlefield. Okay, I want that creature back. Do it now. Put it back in my hand. There's no waiting. This card is very very strong. Like, oh, you board wipe me. Well, that's pretty good. All right, I'll just get my best thing back right now and then I'll just replay it. It's so good. It's just like that recursion and the mill, both key components, but it's not stacked on some like clunky nonsense like Nyx Weaver. I love that card, but that's kind of the evolution of a Nyx Weaver where it's like, all right, pay three, then you wait, then you're going to get some mill, then you get your best card back. This is just like, no, here's the mill. And now you can just get your best card back right away. It's what, so nuts. When it dies, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you Making it die is trivial in the decks that they're playing. It's so good. It's even a zombie. Yeah. So uh, let's go on. What's number two, BZ? Well, it's Welcoming Vampire. Mono white. Coming in. Two and a white for a 2-3 vampire with flying. Whenever one or more other creatures with power two or less enter the battlefield under your control, draw a card. This ability triggers only once per turn. I want tokens. I want dummies. I want mono white weenies. And I want instant speed ways to do it. And then this is like... One of the best card draw spells in white ever. This card is really sweet. Yeah, I don't even. You don't even necessarily need the instant speed ways to do it. Yeah, it is a huge upgrade. Like so you want potentially having that is going to up boost this card up. But even if your deck doesn't, as long as you guarantee get that card draw the first turn it's out, yeah. it's going to be worth it. That's what makes a card like this where you can draw once per turn. Uh, so much better than like a Phyrexian unit is getting that card the very first turn and Welcome Vampire can just do that. Yeah, I love the ceiling on this card. I love everything about it. I think that's super fair. Uh, we don't need, you know, people were complaining like this doesn't have once each turn. Ugh. It's like we don't need that on this card. They can make a more expensive version that does it whenever. This is such a step in the right direction, but even that doesn't contribute to it being number two. This is just a really good card despite the fact that it's only once per turn. Just, you can find plenty of instant speed ways even in your non instant speed decks to just get extra value off of this. I love this card. Yeah, car the card just goes in basically all your mono white and boros decks that care about your creature counts. But this it, could go in like token decks too, like green mm -hmm. white. This is better than Beast Whisper. It's better than Guardian Project. It's I mean, you true. can get more stuff off of it. Yeah, if you're playing a tokens deck where like instant sorceries are what's making your creatures, then Welcoming Vampire can be a creature that you know now makes your tokens draw because tokens don't usually draw. Oh yeah, this is a definitely the sweet spot. And the number one card also white. What is it? It is by invitation only. Three white white for a sorcery. Choose a number between zero and thirteen. Each player sacrifices that many creatures. I want to start off with the first part of this card. It says choose a number between 0 and 13. You can pick 0. You can pick 13. I saw some confusion in the comments thinking you can. You have to pick a number in between them. When someone says pick a number between 1 and 5, 1 and 5 are options. That's how, that's how pick a number works. Pick a number between. It also doesn't imply that you can only pick 0 or 13. This actually chooses on resolution, meaning that decks that want to like maybe sacrifice and do some other things... In response, like if your sack outlet is Viscerous, Viscerous here. here and you want to get the scries, don't do that because if you sack your whole board and it's all gone, they could just choose, they could choose zero on resolution. Uh, the downside of this card is you potentially do not kill everyone's creatures if they have a really insanely wide board. That does happen sometimes where they have 15, 16, 17, 18 creatures and they're incredibly wide. And this is going to be like, oh no, they keep their best three things. Uh oh, that's bad but it works the flip way too. Because if you have the most creatures on the battlefield, you have eight and the next closest person has five. All right, I'll keep my big, my three biggest threats on the battlefield. Woo, ah, this card is very, very versatile. It's got tragic arrogance vibes because if you build to it and you see it coming, which obviously you do, it's in your hand. Now you're going to get nothing wrong. Uh, nothing bad's going to be happening to you. We have expendable creatures. Get them out of here. Sorry, guys. But then... It's a one-sided wipe. You can smack in that turn with the three creatures or ten creatures that you kept. This is such a sweet card, and I love that they can't start shenanigans in response without it being just even better for you. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. This card is just very, very good. I think the thing that takes us from being number 15 on this list, number one, is everybody sacrifices creatures. This is not a destruction. Yeah, it, it would it would be close and pretty good. Uh, if it destroyed all creatures, but now you hit those indestructible creatures, those regenerates. Anything that's left on the battlefield, 
when the Swiss Alps is going to be sacrificed. It just it makes it that much better and put, definitely is what took it from like a lower spot to the number one spot on this list. Yeah, I love being able to choose a resolution. They, there's nothing to do before. It's like the old the old court of calling whiny trick that we talk about all the time. Uh, this is a sweet one for Model White. I think it's up. Model White's getting like the best board wipes. We got Tragic Arrogance, Vanquish the Horde, and this to choose from now in like our go wide decks. I don't even know what I. Maybe you just play all three. Yeah, they'll all be super strong. But. That is our video. Special shout outs to all of our patrons. Love you all as much as we can without making you uncomfortable. Thank you guys for supporting this channel and keeping the daily content flowing. It is the best way to support us. Going to patreon.com, picking it here. And, you know, it's basically giving us money so that we can continue making the content we love to make for you. We do make this full time, which is why we appreciate you listening to our shout outs, which while they are for the same brands every time, I like to shake it up. TCG player. Guess what? Affiliate link. Description. You. Me affiliate link right now click it buy the cards you want check out and then we get a kickback on the order courtesy of tcg player yeah yeah the reason that you you're shaking up snow work is half of them don't make sense they're all great you're not going to the link with them don't act like if they click on that link they get a little like there pop is, up there's off a season. little me like like clipping nope like, that's I'm, i hear you're trying to buy cards on tcg player yeah no see this is a lie can see, i help you with that bz has to make, lie his way out of his bad you won't shout know outs. until you click it and remember Joe's shout out six years ago was, all right, guys, that's the video. Special shout outs to our, da, da, da. it's the same shout out. Unoriginal. Yeah. Oh, wow. Do people comment about your TCG play? No. Everybody what? says thank you, BZ. That was such a good link. Wow. That was such a good but shout wait, out. Wait, hold on. Wait, in the comments, what do they normally say? Oh, they say, I love you guys as much as I can without making you uncomfortable. Yeah, they reference it because you just, you're jamming it down their throats. So you're not giving them anything else to work with. It's called a catchphrase, BZ. Get one. We have one. You, at the end of the video. Get one. You loser. They're Dragon, my catchphrases. I say all the catchphrases. Dragon Shield. <laughs> buy, buy the sleeves. They're in the description. EU, US, best sleeves. They don't sell shields. They do not sell shields. They, they do not sell shields? They, they they don't sell seashells by the seashore. The shields. Yeah, the shields. Uh, but Dragon Shield is the best sleeves on the planet. I honestly believe that. But what? Dragon Shield is the best sleeves. <laughs> Joe J Cherries. Jake and Shield is the best sleeves. Jake and Shield? <laughs> I'm changing the name. Uh, Dragon Shield. It's on the screen. The, it's it's word association. It doesn't matter. If I go Dagon Deal. They, Dagon they, Deals? What the, an idiot. Exactly, but it's here. It's like the ghost thing where it's like, ooh, and oh, the, the EVP. But you're like, about that is the boo. And then you say like, oh, did you hear that, guys? He said easy poo. Uzu boo. See, he said easy poo. <laughs> I so I will shout out real quick our Discord. We can come hang out, share memes, play games, talk to us, etc. Ask for deck help. But for tidbit about our lives, I used to watch ghost shows with my dad all the time, and now that I'm like an adult, looking back on them, even if you're like a die-hard believer in the afterlife or ghosts or spirits or whatever. I don't even think that factors into the equation of how much of a sham are ghost shows, like ghost hunters, ghost something, the ghost adventurers. Like, oh, my God, all of these things. I, It is like a joke to me now. Um, yeah, those every single one of those shows is so obviously staged and fake. And it's so weird because I, I remember when I was 20, 21. And I started uh, dating my first serious boyfriend at the time, and his brother was in, and his his brother and his and his brother's girlfriend were watching one of these shows, and I laughed, and they were mad at me. I'm like, is this serious? I'm like, that's I'm like, that's definitely fake. And then they're just like, what? No, they wouldn't fake that. Look, the sheet moved. It's like, you think it's not easy to move a sheet? It's not like you can't. You, it's not a full shot of the room. No, it wasn't even that. There was literally the shot of the bed like this. There could have just been anything. Anything over here could have literally been a human right. grabbing the sheet and pulling it. But people want to buy this crap. If well, you throw 17 people in a house at 3 a.m. and you tell me you hear footsteps, it's like, obviously you hear footsteps. There's 17 people and a camera crew running around this. I don't understand. Even if they don't actively stage anything, they are dramatized to the to point that I can't take it seriously. I just try to think about how many points are there where... They know they're producing a product that people need to consume. They know what needs to be in the show. How many opportunities and points do they have to, you know, ham it up a little bit and and add some things and cut to misleading time points? It's just, it's just drivel, I guess. Uh, sorry if you like ghost shows. I challenge anybody who believes in ghosts to give me its exact definition of a ghost that everyone can agree on in the comments below. Oh, that's not possible. I would love to see it. If oh. you can, if you believe in ghosts, show us, give us that definition below so that we can actually find them because. 
we know what they are. I literally have no idea what a ghost is. Also, like, like I just don't, is, I don't even know. Nobody does, and you can't know what a ghost is. It's a spirit of a person. Okay, what's it made out of? What's a spirit? I as, don't know. As soon as you, as soon as you ask what it's made out of, is when everything falls apart. What like not even that? It's like what's one property of a spirit? I don't know. Yeah, are they able to interact? Because especially if you watch ghost shows, are they able to interact with tangible things? Some people would say no. Some people would say no. But in ghost shows, they do it all the time. And in different ways. And in different ways. Sometimes I love the machinery that is built to detect them. We got the we got the ghost sleep apnea three thousand. It's like, oh, here he is farting. We caught it. But they, yeah, they detect like it they have they like detect things in the air. It's like what do you detect? The, the change in I they, don't know. They, they literally electromagnets. Uh, it's the most it's basically it's literally like watching a bad movie. And they use pseudoscience. Like Why the, are we it's like right? the flux capacitor? Exactly. They, they just pseudoscience it up and just say words that don't make any sense. You go, yeah, sounds pretty legit. Must be, must be real. We gotta go before we rant about. So long. That was like 20, 10 minutes of ranting about ghosts. Not quite that long. Five five minutes. Still long. Peace out, trap scout.